Hear Me See Me podcast is sponsored by Zenoti, the number one cloud software for salons and spas. Because when people feel good, they find their greatness. I am Stuart Roberts, and I'm really excited to introduce my new podcast, Hear Me See Me. It's just over five years ago. I did something that changed my life. What it did, more than I could have ever realised, it helped me. I have met some absolutely amazing people, some of the people that work in some of these places. Many of them are volunteers, but some of them, it is their job. I had this idea after being inspired by a guy in America I'd seen cutting hair on the streets and seeing the difference it made to the guys who were there. This is more than a job. This is a calling. Hello, this is Stuart from Hear Me See Me podcast. Today I've got a lovely lady who uh, we sort of followed each other on Instagram and stuff for quite a while and it felt like I knew her but we'd never met until recently. Uh, that meeting we'll explain a bit more later. But so today, I'd like to introduce you to the lovely Zoe Kingham. Hello, Zoe. Hi, how are you? I'm, well, I'm good. I'm good. good. I'm, you know, I like to say it even if I'm not, but I am actually good today. Excellent. How are you? Yep, fine. All good, thank you. Um, right, so what we'll do, uh, we'll, 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 for anyone who knows, like, you've got kind of had people you know, but some, for anyone who doesn't, um, we're going to go on to the lovely work you do at some point, but we'll, we'll begin by going back to what, what took the young Zoe back into hairdressing back in the day. Oh, God, this seems so many years ago. <laughs> I started hairdressing when I was about 12, so that is a long, long time ago. Um, and, I, and then I started doing Saturday work and I'd done an apprenticeship with Simon Harris and Jenny Dow that owned Headlines in um, oh. Billericay. And I worked for them for 21 years and I had the most amazing time. Probably my best times in hairdressing, actually. Um, you know, we've done loads and loads of work with L'Oreal um, as apprentices. We did loads of competition and stage work. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Simon Harris is now my um, my employee's uh, salon consultant, so it's really weird. It's all gone round in a bit of a circle. Um, and then because of personal circumstances, I relocated to Morden, and then I started working for Vicky and Jane at Reed Hair, and that's been really good. And I've been there for 13 years now. I, te- I work my hours still around my children, so I'm on the shop floor most of the time. And I've done a lot of education in my years in cutting, um, but now it's mainly in hair loss and scalp problems, which there's a lot of hair loss problems at the moment. Well, I was going to say that. Um, how, how was things in general, you know, like starting at the beginning of the year? How did lockdown affect like you? What personally? Or on a- yeah, and then and then what did you see going on around everything? Uh, on a personal note, I think like everybody else, I, I didn't think this pandemic was going to come to this country. And then all my family live in Spain, and then all of a sudden Spain gets hit really bad, and it was. Their lockdown in Spain is a lot harder than what ours was here, and it was really, really scary. Um, and then it hit here, and then it's, you know, you can't go to work, you can't go out. I couldn't see my partner for weeks on end because we don't live in the same household. Um, and then after a while, you just start, you have to learn to live with it, I think. I think this whole virus, we've got to learn to live with it and respect it and not be scared of it. And then when we eventually went back to work, I, you know, as hairdressers, we're not just hairdressers. I think we're therapists as well. And, you know, you've, we've heard some really harsh stories, to be honest, and you have to put that hard hat on and just listen to people and the amount of stress that people have been under. And because of that, I've actually seen lots of people's hair falling out at the moment. I've never, 
you know, I've done with I've only been in hair loss for about four years, so I'm quite new to it still. But I've never seen as many people's hair falling out in the plug hole as I have at this time. So it just shows the amount of stress that people have been under because we get to that stress causes an awful lot of hair loss, mm. hair breakage as well. So why why is that? I mean, I, I, in my experience, I've, I've often put it down to stress when people have got a bit extra hair fall. Um, but what, yeah. what causes it to, to kind of react in that way, stress? Right. I think firstly, I have met, I have seen a few people that have actually had um, this virus that have had COVID. And I can honestly say the devastation that it has had an effect on their hair where their hair is just completely broken and really, really fallen out very badly. Now, the reason this is happening is, is when you're ill or, or, any, or anything, your immune system um, is it, really compromised, basically. So this is where it all starts from. And then you get lots of deficiencies in your body. So you get anemic, you get lack of iron, lack of vitamin C, uh, zinc, there's lots and lots of vitamins and minerals that your body has deficiencies for. Um, when it comes to hair, your hair is your hair follicle is the second largest dividing cell of your body, so it needs huge and huge amounts of good nutrition and vitamins and minerals for that hair follicle, that cell, to grow healthy and to stay healthy. Now. Because people have become ill or they've become very, very stressed, their body, their immune system is compromised, so they're getting deficiencies in their body. So their food intake is not enough goodness for the hair to grow well. So that is why I'm finding a lot of people are having hair falling out or slightly breaking at the moment. I think also in lockdown... Some people become very healthy, become very fit, and other pe- and other people, you know, was very scared of everything, and maybe their diet and their alcohol intake wasn't as good as it should have been. So all these factors have a huge, um, you know, it compromises the immune system hugely. So when you you said about the lack of vitamins and and stuff like that. Is it something people could at least help a bit with, with vitamin, taking vitamin supplements? Would, it, would that help or is that? Yeah, I would say if anybody's experiencing any sort of hair fall or they're finding their hair is not in as good as condition as it should be, start looking, first of all, at your um, your food intake because three good meals a day is still not enough good nutrition for your hair follicle, your hair cell to grow really well. You've got to have a really good balanced diet. There's lots of proteins, your carbs, your good carbs, your nuts, your uh, uh, seeds and everything. And then look at taking maybe uh, some sort of vitamins and minerals as well, probably perhaps some vitamin C, some iron, vitamin D, get out in that sunlight. You know, even when it's a bit of a gloomy day, vitamin D is really good for you. Uh, B12 is really good. They lots lots of things to um, you know to help you and to keep you healthy. Mm. I think oh. it's what you said, rather than a supplement like vitamin D, is actually get outside. Just get outside, yeah. yeah. Yeah, vitamin D is like a healer as well. It, you know, it, um, it's good for your bones and it's good for skin and it's good for everything. It regenerates cells, so it is really, really good for you. Just get outside, get fresh air. We need fresh air. Yeah. I, th- I, th- I mean, I say that, I'm indoors all day today doing podcasts, but I think maybe at the, after I've done the last one this afternoon, maybe rather than drive oh. to the Tesco, I'll walk. Yeah. <laughs> and a bit of cardio coming back, <laughs> get some vitamin D in me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Lots of water, you know, none of you know, do we drink enough water? Probably not. You know, just just got to have a really good, healthy, balanced diet. Well, I think, um, you know, definitely stress is a big thing. It, it's obviously people's mental health is suffering, things like that. Um, so what, what, as you say, actually, it's great you say that you work for SAR. I didn't know you realised, I didn't 
know that you worked for Simon all them years. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, headlines is always was always and it, it is a great business as well. Um, mm-hmm. What then took you on that journey from being a, a, a stylist and everything else to then getting into this specialist field? What what was the catalyst? It all started with um, one of my clients, actually. And um, I started doing this lady's hair, and I'd done her hair for quite a few years, and it, she had the most finest, really thin hair that her scalp was showing. And I just... I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to send her or, or, or anything. And I thought, hang on a minute, I've been hairdressing, what, 25, 30 years, and I didn't know how to help this lady. And um, Vicky, who I work for now at Reed Hair, she'd done the Trevor Sorby course, My New Hair, when it very first started, which was probably, I don't know, maybe about 14 years ago now. Um, she did a little bit with it, but then... As their business grew, she sort of, you know, they, they stepped back and was doing office duties more. And I said, like, I, I need to do so. I need to help this lady. This is ridiculous. So that's when I started. That's when I went on some of the My New Hair course because I just felt I had so much experience in hairdressing and educating other people in cutting, colouring or whatever, and I can't help this poor lady who's in tears and she's hardly got any hair. I did, I, like, how can I not help her? And so you, so you did the course. Uh, what is for anyone who doesn't know? Uh, how did that come about? That charity. What, what was? What, what is the charity about? And um, so um, the charity, as I say, was set up quite a lot of uh, years ago now by uh, Trevor Sorby. And exactly the same thing happened with him. Different circumstance. It was a family friend that had got cancer and needed a wig. And it was he he was the same. Where do I get a wig from? You know, he has all this experience, but still didn't know how to help his friend you know, to get a wig, what's going to happen to the hair, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, he founded this charity. And what they do is they uh, educate um, independent salons all around the country and I think overseas now as well. Um, And there's three levels with this course and I've done all three levels. Um, And it teaches you... um, you get taught by Macmillan nurses, so you get taught how to uh, how people are feeling if they've got any sort of hair loss, they've got cancer, what they go through. You get taught um, wig fitting, wig cutting. Um, we got taught the basics of hair loss science by a scientist. Um, and as, as you go through the level two, it gets deeper into the wig fitting, the wig cutting. And then the level three was really, really hard, actually. That was a real toughie on an emotional part because that's when the Macmillan nurses really tested us, pushed us to see if we could cope with seeing people that have got hair loss because it, it, it can be really hard sometimes and you've got to look after yourself as well when you're dealing with a lot of people because they offload on you. I would recommend anybody to do the course, but you've got to you've got to be a real people person, a real sympathetic, you know, sympathetic person, and a really good listener. I think I think it's um, it's a, there's a lot of similarities with what we do at Haircuts Farmers. The fact that yeah. you you said there you've got to protect yourself, um, yeah, and it's you don't want to get to the point where you're cold that you, you know, you're unaffected because, you know, you're a human being after all, but you do need to get a level of protection there. How do you cope with that? Um, My bosses are really good, actually. If if I've got something in that's really quite hard, more Vicky, actually, because I think Vicky's experienced this more, that she will call me at home maybe that evening and say, are you okay? etc etc I've got good people at work that I can just it's offloading you've just got to offload it to somebody um even if they're not taking it in you the best thing is you've got to talk and I do get really emotional and you know I have cried with people 
I mean, we're lucky at Reed here as well. We've got a really beautiful lounge upstairs, so it's very, very private. And, you know, when people are sitting there in tears and their children are sitting there in tears, I can't help it. I do cry. Cool. And I, that's fine. You're, we're human beings. Mm. And it just shows that you do, you, you care. You really, really care. It's, and it is the people with cancer that I'm talking about. It's people that have got even thinning hair or alopecia. You know, I do see a lot of people that have got alopecia and I cut their wigs for them. And I think people with alopecia get a little bit forgotten about as well. Um, they do tend to go underground a little bit too. Um, but they are, you know... <laughs> Their hair will never, ever grow. Some people's hair with alopecia will never, ever grow back. Um, and it's hard. They've got to learn, you know, they have got to learn to cope with that as well. We, I mean, on early on the podcast, when it started, I had Gail Porter on, who um, is yeah. very well known for being uh, having an alopecia. Uh, yeah. Uh, and she... She, I learned so much because when we were talking, um, she explained so much the effect it has. And if you're a person who's not been in that, it's like anything. Um, if you've not been around that or you don't really get the full extent of it, but it was it was fascinating to hear how, how many different aspects of her life it affected. Yeah, it is, it is huge. And as I say, I think sometimes people that have got alopecia, they, they get a little bit forgotten about because they are, their hair will never, ever grow back. Um, yeah, and it is, and it is, it's really, really tough. We did um, last year, myself and Vicky and a couple of the, the, the guys, we did um, a, a bit of a photo shoot and um, um, some videos last year of two girls that we knew that both had actually had um, alopecia. Um, and it was really humbling to, the girls hadn't met each other, how their experiences were so different and, you know, um, how people um, accept them, you know, going to the doctors and not really getting a lot of help with, with it medically. Um, that was really, that was really, really interesting, really interesting. I, th I think that's the thing is hair, uh, we know as hairdressers, but it be can become such a big part of your identity and especially if it's something that happens fairly quickly, alopecia, it's almost like part of your identity is taken away. And, yes. and, and Gail, like, said to me, I, as she was, she was sort of, I mean, she was such an extreme example of it because she was, one minute she was in all the lads' mags and everything. Yes. She was just known for her, her appearance, and then it changed. And she said, the work, dry it up, you know, like, so, yeah. you know, like, that's the effect it can have. It, uh, it, it's huge. People don't, people with alopecia as well, they, you know, a lot of people think that they've got cancer and people feel sorry for them because they think that they're poorly and they do have quite, um, you know, they do have to explain that, you know, no, I've got alopecia, I've got no hair. It, yeah, unfortunately, people, people do look, don't they? We, we, we're all, we all do it. We all do it with anything, I think. Yeah. Yeah, she she was saying that that's one of the big, she's a very funny lady and she she was saying about how, you know, people go, oh, how long have you got? You know? I know, yeah, I've heard this a lot. I know. How long have you got? I know. It, it, yeah, I mean, people are only, you know, they're not doing it to offend no. you, are they? They're, it's just human nature, isn't it? Um, but, oh. yeah, we, it, it, <laughs> The girls did say that. They, they did get that quite a lot of the time. I mean, one of the girls that um, done a photo shoot for us, she's never, ever worn a wig, never. And she's proud of how she looks, and she looks stunning. As um, the other lady, Charlotte, she always wore a wig, and it was amazing, actually. When we'd done the photo shoot, she got a wig, and she just tossed it off, basically. Um, and, you know, to, to, that was the first time that she'd let people see her without a wig on. So it was quite a, a big moment for her. And that must have been quite moving. That, yeah, uh, it was. It was. It was. And the sad thing is, you know, the girls like you know lose their eyebrows, their eyelashes, and it's all part of your identity. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, what happened, you know, like while we actually finally came to me, which was a bit odd the day we met because then it was almost, oh, here you are, because we, <laughs> we felt like we knew each other so well. Yeah. But um, a really good friend, <laughs> yeah, a really good friend of mine has been, I mean, her story is unbelievable. She's She's been through so much and... Uh, this was uh, this was at the stage where she's she's recently going through another lot of chemo uh, after many different times, but this time it looks like the severity means that she's a good chance she'll lose her hair. And yeah. uh, you was the first person I thought of because she said, um, "I think get, I think she thought I might know, you know." Uh, and I, went, I thought, Zoe, I've got I've got to get her to Zoe. And uh, from my, this may have been to interest you because this was. I was like a third party, so yeah. there's you and my friend, and we came in. But from the third party perspective, we went sort of through the salon straight upstairs. It's a wonderfully private, comfortable environment. Um, you are very, very good at what you do. You, you know, like um, I can see why people warm to you. Uh, and the whole experience, having someone who knows what they're talking about, also has got that people power. Um, it makes a very difficult um, situation and experience that bit easier. So I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> oh, bless you. oh, that's really good. I'm glad you said that because, as I say, you, it's good being that third party that, you know, that you felt that you felt comfortable in that situation as well. But it's yeah, it, it, it's 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 tough. It can be it can be really really tough. I just I always say to people if they're going to lose their hair, more so with probably cancer um, people that I see, is I like to take the whole hair wig thing stress off them, so they haven't got to deal with that. Let me deal with that because also. Once they start recovering and their hair starts to grow through, this is a key point when we've got to really, really look after the hair. And this is when a lot of the science comes into it, um, you know, how to keep that hair strong, how to um, get lots of protein back in your hair, when you can colour it, when you can't colour it, because this is a little bit of a grey area that I come to. But the whole team at Reed, we they have been educated as to, you know, when if they see somebody who's recovering from um, chemotherapy, you know how to look after their ha hair afterwards. I mean, chemotherapy in itself and radiotherapy, all of these things. Um, I mean, they, they're life saving and, and necessary, but yeah. they are a, a massive poison to the system, aren't they? So they do have their side effects. Yeah, and and they're going to kill the bad cells off and they're going to kill the good cells off so a hair follicle is obviously a cell so um you know they they kill that cell off so when you start to recover it's you know getting you know as they say the good the right nutrients and everything back into your body everything with hair you start from the inside out basically so our hair here is actually cosmetic um, and we're all very much as hairdressers, all trying to look after our hair, the condition, tame, tame the wildness of hair, um, you know, getting more body in hair. But we're not really looking at the inside of how it grows because the stronger that hair follicle is, that cell, the better hair growth you're going to have and the better, you know, healthier hair you're going to have as well. And this is the whole thing with this whole pandemic as well. And I will say to hairdressers as well, be very, very vigilant with everything. Because even if somebody has been well during this whole pandemic, but because of the, the stress that has caused many people, when you're colouring hair, please do the skin tests and please do um, strand tests and um, incompatibility tests on the hair because I've actually turned away quite a lot of colour work recently because the hair may look all right, but then when I've gone to test it, the hair's just fallen to bits. So this whole thing going back to nutrition um, and, and hair care. I mean, you've, you've, you've highlighted a couple of things there that, you know, so apparent uh, in, in, in our 
profession, that, that we are a, a, a real uh, thorough profession, that we do these things, that we've got stringent guidelines. And it's such a shame that, that it's not given the credence that it deserves hairdressers in the industry. You know, like Millie Kendall, people at the, at the British Beauty Council are doing wonderful things to get it acknowledged as, a, as an industry. Um, but it's almost, and, and, and I don't always think that we should be the first to be shut down because we're in such a cleanest environment. We work yeah. so well uh, compared to some other things that are left open that have got blatant disregard to things. What do you think of that? Oh, I, I got myself in quite a state quite a while ago and I did have to, you know, I did have to really talk about it quite a lot because for me personally, uh, you know, I've looked, you know, I didn't see my partner for weeks and weeks and weeks. I've been here on my own with my children, protecting them, looking after them, you know, which we all do. I can't see any of my family. I've, you know, I've cancelled four flights to go and see my family in Spain. And it really, really pees me off when I see people flouting the rules. And it has really caused me quite, you know, quite a a lot of anxiety and anger, actually. And what you're saying about the hairdressing environment, when we was uh, furloughed before, quite a lot of us really did do a lot of courses and it was learning about COVID and how it worked, uh, you know, you know what it's all about. And, you know, a back to work plan about the cleanliness and everything. And I feel more safe going into our salon than I do to a supermarket. I actually don't go into the supermarket. I do my shopping online and I go to my local farm shops and stuff. But yeah, it does, it it really does get on my nerves when you you know you see other shops open and you think, well, you haven't even got a mask on, let alone having a, a mask and a visor and you're trying to cut hair and you're being a therapist to most of these people as well. You're trying to lift people's moods up. Pe- people are quite sombre at the moment as well. And, you know, you're, you're a really personal person to that. I just don't think hairdressers have got, you know, they're, ne- they're always bottom of the par, I think. We're never, ever up here. You know, people say, oh, you're just a hairdresser. And you get that a lot. Mm. When you say that, but we, the, yeah, I can understand what you mean by being at the bottom of the pole, but at any any industry sort of survey or any of these sort of, you know, glossy magazine surveys, what's the happiest place, work environment? Hairdressers, hairdressing is always in the top. In the, it's always, a, if not the top, it's in the top three. So as an industry, it's a great place to work. Yeah. Because everyone's happiest, you know. But at the same thing, then it's not taken uh, seriously. I think there's an element about hairdressers that possibly bring it on themselves, include myself in this, that they don't take themselves seriously, that they don't, you know, that, that, that there's, there's, that there's too much. Um, sometimes um, pe- people aren't professional in, in, what, in what they do. Uh, but having said that, the majority of it, I mean, I go into, we're talking about salons, which is a great, clean, professional, safe environment. Yeah. I go to homeless centres. Now, it, it, in, in a lot of the position I go into, I would rather go into a homeless centre than go into yeah. a supermarket because yeah. everyone there, the people who work in volunteering centres, are very, very careful yeah. We're extremely careful with our volunteers and all of our PPE. So I, I really think that, that the people's opinions need to change about this. I totally yeah. agree with you on that. We've actually, um, you know, we, 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 we've been really fortunate that, you know, since we've been down, you know, since we started back, back work before, we've actually had a huge amount of new clients coming to us. And I think... And, you know, they've not gone back to where they, they was getting their hair done because they're not happy with the PPE. That You know, people are really fussy where they are going and the questions that they are asking, what, what we are putting into place. But I definitely feel very, I feel very safe at work, very safe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, 
I, th- I think, I mean, recently the report that the British Beauty Council brought out, um, it's off the top of my head, I'm, I'm pretty certain, it's something like uh, 30 billion that's brought to the, the, the UK yeah. most profit. Yeah. It's an incredible size industry. You know, it's huge, it yeah. It's hairdressing, beauty, um, you know, barbering and all those things. Put them all together. It's massive, a massive, massive industry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is. It is huge. So hopefully we get back to work soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, please, God, this 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 four week, you know, four weeks is it's doable. You know, it's 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 all full that we have to shut. But four weeks we can, you know, we're, we're nearly we're nearly in end of the first week. So, it, it you know, it's doable as long as they don't extend it. I know. I'm I'm slightly worried about that, but you know, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they, you know, they, you know, they won't. But if everybody abides by the rules and meant to be doing what they're meant to be doing, you know, we will get through this. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I mean, like, as we were saying about the salons and the safe environment of, of, of where we work. I mean, everything started to open up, and then they had the eat out to help out stuff going on. Um, and then I, I, I went and sat in a. Um, a restaurant with a couple of pals and it was on a Friday night and, and it like, it was packed and yeah, you know, there's no, this, they've not taken any tables out. There's not, and yet salons have got like whole units taken out. Now yeah. the thing is, if you, it, it, over the last 20 to 10 years, at least profits have gone down on the high street, you know, yeah. even before COVID profits were going down, for, for numerous reasons, um, you, you got to the point where people would be grateful to get 10, 20 percent profit margin. Uh, and then, you know, more, more realistically, I think there was a report done that 90 percent uh, of British salons are breaking even or less. Mm-hmm. Which is ridiculous. Like, you know, there's, there's people, uh, there's people's livelihoods and they're, they're working so hard to just to break even. So you take away. Uh, if you take even forty percent of the units out, or you you know, you, you take forty percent of turnover away, even if even with help and aid, any fool can see that it's not going to last long. And there's a, a big worry yeah. about salons going into the next next year about who who's going to survive. Yeah, I know. I mean, for me personally, you know, I I don't own the salon, so when it comes to figures, I can't really comment on that. But you know, we've got 19 sections in the salon. We're over, you know, two, three floors. And, you know, we can only have nine nine people in at one time now. So, you know, compared to 19 sections, you know, yeah. everything's been really good. We've, we've had to change our shifts and, you know, just work as a team and help each other out. You know, before this few days, you know, we knew it was going to lock down again. The salon was like Christmas. For four days, it was like Christmas. Yeah. And everybody <laughs> took so many hours. And it will be like that when it opens again, which is really good. And it's great that we've got, lo- you know, clients, a, a loyalty we've got is is great. But, yeah, I think the next couple of years is going to be really, really tough. Really yeah. tough. Definitely. Well, there's going to be an aftermath, I think, and the aftermath will be when the helpers stopped, the government helpers stopped. Yeah. It's got to stop at some point, and then people are rebuilding. And it depends how people have managed that help, you know, whether they've put it to good use. And Yeah. You know, um, it, it, it's I do, I do worry for the industry, but the teams like yours and Reed have always I've always looked to uh, uh, I, I don't personally know the owners but I've always you can, they've always had a, a, a great reputation in, in in their part of the country and um, from things you've said there they're likely to be the survivors because you've got it sounds like you've got a great team of people working together just the fact that you're your, your managers and people are ringing you to say, are, are you okay after you've had those sessions? You know, yeah. that's what a, a real team and business that's going to survive needs to be. They need, they need to act, you know, they all take, take care of each other. And, um, and, and you need that balance. You need the creativity and the wonderful work going out. 
but you do need these business people behind it all that do know yeah. enough. So you, it's that blend, isn't it, of getting it, get it together yeah. right and to survive. So did um, I know uh, Vicky uh, did, and and myself did, and another one of my colleagues. We did um, a, like a course in mental health, actually. Um, and you know, this is a problem anyway, but it's going to be an absolutely huge problem in in years to come. And it's like it's in the workplace. It's really recognizing when people are struggling and going the right way about things and the way that people are spoken to. And I think that's really important at the minute. And it's like just checking in with people all the time. Mm. Um, I, know, I know the bar, uh, Tom Chapman, he done a, he's got a wonderful charity that he's built up, that, um, that the, the Lions Barber Collective, and it's about men talking to their barber. Um, yeah. So it, as powerful as that is, it's the same with hairdressing, that, you know, yeah. hairdressing guys talking to their... It, it, we're, we're often the person that knows the most about people, most personal details. And yep. um, and I think it's, you know, it's great what he's done with the industry and, and it's part that the hairdressing industry needs to take on board as well, that uh, we need to educate ourselves uh, because whether it's officially part of our job or not, it is a big part, you know. Uh, people will really open up to you. I mean, as I said before, you know, like a couple of weeks before this lockdown, you know, I can I can think of just two of my clients I've just seen on on a, on a day, and I've known them for years, and they was just so flat. And I just had to say, "Are you okay? Do you want to talk about anything?" And they just offloaded, <laughs> offloaded, and you know, by the time they walked out, they was like buzzing <laughs> again. Yeah. So it is it is just so so important? So yeah. As hairdressers, we are definitely therapists as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the time's up, I had someone in my chair, and I've just sort of been chatting, and I've just stopped, and I've just put my hands on his shoulders and said, are you all right? And then the, the yeah. tears have just come, yeah. <laughs> flooded out, and then it all comes out, that, that yeah. what's going on in their life. And it's a special thing we've got, isn't it? It is. And I, and I think as well, this is where we've got to be, you know, and this is what I was taught, actually, with the Trevor Sorby course with the Macmillan nurses. And, you know, although they was teaching us about, you know, how the, the you know, hair loss affects these people, they've done a huge amount on, on things, how it affects us. And I know myself and some of the guys that work, we finished work and we are, we're on our feet. And it is the emotional, the emotional, um, you know, people are offloading all day, all day. And the time you get home, you just sit down and you don't want to talk and you don't want to move. So, it, you know, as hairdressers, we, it is having a, a big effect on us as well because we're taking on other people's, you know, sad times really. I think uh, that's a very valid point. I think that, that um, oh, I really relate to that because the times I've had a busy, I've had, I've loved it. I've had a, a really busy sell on Saturday. So yeah. Saturdays was always buzzing, you know, and you get a busy Saturday and then, but you, you, as you say, it's mentally draining. And I've literally come in and I've got, I mean, I've got five kids. I've got three grandchildren. And, and I've, yeah. I've come in on a Saturday evening and I've not even been out of face going out or anything. And your wife maybe have been at home all day and the kids and everything. She wants to go out. <laughs> yeah, she even wants to go out, get away from them. <laughs> well, they all want to talk to you. And then you're, you're almost like this antisocial monster. Yeah. Um, it's not fair, is it? <laughs> no, no, it isn't. But it's, you know, it's what it is, isn't it? And you probably get that with, you know, what you do with your, you know, your your charity work that you do because, you know, you're, you're taking, you know, you're taking on what, you know, what they're going through. And that must be really tough, really hard. It, it, it is. And we have, and it's something I'm conscious of with our volunteers. In fact, yeah, uh, it's something we're looking to do have a, a a service for our volunteers that they can get some counselling because sometimes the, the stories, uh, uh, I must say, sometimes it's hilarious. We have great fun at the session. Yeah. There's some great characters, but occasionally you just get this story comes out from the quiet person, you know, the young woman or an old person or 
just comes from like nowhere and then it just it wipes the, the legs away from you, you know? yeah it's horrific that's the, the the life that some people have had so <laughs> yeah you, you do sometimes take that stuff home with you and, and it and it, it it can it can be prob- a problem yeah it can it's the same with you know like the hair loss I'll, uh, you know especially you know if we get children in I, a, a while ago we had this this lovely little girl come in and her hair was falling out when hair falls out it really does hurt and this little girl she had masses and masses of black hair and all she wanted she just wanted her hair cut really really short she wanted it shaved off and usually they would book her in with me but it was just the mum phoned up and just said my little girl wants her hair cut didn't say anything what was happening and it was booked in with a very, very young stylist and she cut the hair short and the little girl's going, no, I want it shaved, I want it shaved. And, and the poor stylist, she was she was in bits because she thought, I, I can't shave this little girl's hair. She did it and she, and she was really, really good. And honestly, when this little girl's head was shaved, that little girl smiled because she went, it don't hurt no more. Oh. And it's, you know, and when she done it, it was like, the stylist, it was big hug. She'd done so, so well and she just broke down, bless her. But as long as you keep in check with them, you know, I think I think my bosses bought them some flowers and the little girl's mum, um, you know, she uh, she sent in a lovely card, you know, from, from her and, and her little girl, like, you know, thank you for doing this. And you just think, oh, that poor little girl, she's going through all that treatment. But all she was happy about was having her head shaved so it didn't hurt no more with her hair falling out. So wow. it, it's stories like that, it, they're, they're, the, they're the heart-wrenching ones. Yeah. I, I, I remember like when I had the salon, I remember quite a few times over the years um, that I may have a client going through that. And what I often used to suggest was that she'd come at the end of the day so that even yeah. all the staff had gone. And it, So what you've got upstairs, I used to just do that for the client. Uh, in our salon like you know let everyone go home and, and, and just have that personal time with them in a in a salon and um particularly a woman who, who had longer hair yeah I, f- I found that it was more traumatic of this longer hair coming out so i would sometimes suggest that maybe they think about cutting it short so that when it does start to come out it's not such a big you know it's that intermediate and um many a time it it, it it i think we used to spend more time sitting chatting about the prospect of it than actually cutting it because yeah. then you know you spend, you spend 45 minutes to an hour reassuring and saying it you know and then when they're 100 percent sure yeah i think i'll have it all cut off shorter you do this little you know, I, I, I cut hair very quickly, so I do this really little pixie <laughs> cut or something. And nine times out of ten, they would never have had it. They loved it. And yeah. often after, when the hair did come back, they, they'd keep it in a shorter style for quite a while because they, you know, and it it's it was that nice. empowerment. It was like taking control. Their only way of taking control of an uncontrollable situation. Yeah, and, and many people that I've met, this is the whole thing with it. They, you know, people with cancer, they're fighting. They're fighting to, you know, they're fighting for their life. They're fighting for their families and everything. And if they can make one decision, and that is about their hair, you know, that they have gained control of that. And what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, when people's hair starts to grow through, it looks really nice. Everybody I meet, honestly, or if, even if I haven't seen that, seen them before um, their treatment or done their wig fitting or anything like that, people come and see me afterwards if their hair has just started to grow and or how, you know, what to do um, for the future with it. But their hair always looks lovely short. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't, uh, don't like their hair re- as soon as it comes through and it's really short, but I just find it really, really striking, really striking. Yeah, there's often it's people like like you know someone I'm thinking of when I said that someone with longer hair would never think of having a little pixie cut or something. It'd be such a too no. big change, but you know, limitation leads to creation, and 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 lo and behold, they look great with it. 
Yeah, they do. And and you're right, you know, people might grow their hair a little bit, but they don't always tend to go back to how their hair was, actually. So I think sometimes it gives them a chance to have something different, you know, eventually when they can have their hair coloured, um, you know, a different colour, you know, a different image. Because a lot of these, especially ladies, say, I'm not the same person I was before my treatment. I'm different now. My you know, I look different now and sometimes their families find that really hard to deal with because they want maybe mum or nan or sister to be the same person, but you find that they say, but I'm different and I want to look different now. It's, um, you know, they, they want to have like a different image. Yeah, I, I, I think um, it, there's often, as you say, that, that, that it, there's a new lease of life because and sometimes there's a new attitude to life when they've come through something so life-changing that they, that they they want a new beginning so they want a new look or a new change and sometimes i've found that the hair grows back completely different i've had yeah. people with really quite fine straight hair and it's come and it's it's come back really curly or it, yeah it, it's called chemo curl <laughs> chemo curl is that what it is curl. you do find that um it that does happen probably 90 percent of the time after a while, that does tend to calm down and it does, most hair tends to go back to how it originally was, but it's at first, it comes through very, very curly. It's just where the hair follicle, you know, that hair follicle, that cell has got to grow again and it's almost been a bit distorted, it's been attacked. So the hair is all a bit, you know, screw with. Once that calms down and settles down, that hair will start to calm, but it does calm down. Yeah. Also, when the hair grows, there's no protein in the hair. And as hairdressers, we should know that a hair is made out of 80% protein. So protein is like the building blocks of hair. So when that hair comes through, there's no protein. So you find that it's very, it can break very easily. It can be quite frizzy. And that's when us as hairdressers need to make sure they're using the correct products to get that protein back in the hair. The quicker you get the protein and the condition back into the hair, the quicker they may be able to have a colour. Um, you know, the doctors, the oncologists, you know, or nurses will say you can have a colour after six months after having treatment with chemotherapy. It's not always the case. If that hair is in not good enough condition or there's not enough protein in there, you know, you can't colour that hair. You've got to be very, very careful what you do to hair when it starts to grow so you know they're the, they're the things that people need to know anyway you know and they're the f things that even hairdressers need to know that you know yeah. we're told by manufacturers it's it's a six month thing but you still got to do your, your strands test and and, and all, all In the tests. Tests. yeah yeah and, you know, start off with um you know as long as their skin test is okay you know start off i mean we work with weller so we've got things like color freshies um you know, that cover a small amount of the grey hair. It's just like a wash colour. Start off with something like that, first of all. And then as time progresses, the hair becomes stronger and better. You can go on to better things. But the last thing you want to put in something like that is bleach. And that's what a lot of people tend to like, is putting lots of bleach in hair. And it just breaks the hair down terribly. And with yeah. this panic that's going on, just... Test, test the hair. Just make sure the hair is strong. Don't keep putting loads of colour in it and loads of bleach in it. You know, use the colour freshies and, you know, the real, real gentle colours. We're yeah. doing a lot of that at the moment, actually. Yeah. Lots of that. And we've got some really good colour experts that work in the salon and they're really, um, you know, for the gloss colours. It's all about condition as well. Keep hair as good as condition as possible at the moment. I, you know, I think that's it's been an interesting thing as well because after the first initial like long lockdown, a lot of people moved away from colouring, didn't they? Because they they sort yeah. of embraced their long roots, didn't they? Um, did you find that? Yeah, we did actually, and I know a few of my clients have grown their colours out because it's weird actually. Because if you see someone like say every six weeks, you see a small amount of their um, hair growth, but when we were seeing this amount. It was like, oh, my God, you're actually not as white as we thought. So why are you having a permanent tint? We can do something different. Yeah. Or some people's hair was pure, beautiful white. Why are we colouring that? 
you know, as an industry, we want to be making money, but, you know, it's better to, you know, and then they can maybe have some glosses or something different. So in, in actual fact, lockdown with hair was great because we had an opportunity to create something quite different. So, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it has been good. People wanted to change. Um, I don't, I think hairdressers was the most popular people on the planet when lockdown lifted. <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah, we said about it and not taken uh, seriously and not appreciated, but first thing <laughs> everyone was talking about during lockdown was what am I going to do with my hair, you know. Hello. We I think people really found value. <laughs> I think the first three weeks we all done so many hours, it was unbelievable. I think it was <laughs> at night, just huge views of people, which is, um, which is really good, which, it, you know, I'm sure it would be like that again. Yeah. So where's the where's the future of um, you know what, what's what's for you in the future? Oh dear, I think on a personal note, at the moment I'm trying to. My kids are at that age. Unfortunately, my daughter didn't do her GCSEs um, last year, and she's just started college. A lot of it is virtual learning, which is is a real shame. And my son is due to do his GCSEs this year, so. I've sort of uh, the last few months I've really been concentrating on the kids and making sure they're all right mentally myself um in my career I feel like I'm, I'm I'm living through my kids at the moment um I just need to get them through the next couple of years and then I don't know I don't know where I'm going to go from from here really at the moment I don't like to plan too far ahead because you never know what's around the corner well, we we found out that this year, haven't we? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so, well, all I wanted to say to you was, you know, like in closing, was the fact that um, you know it was great to finally meet you. Yeah, and you. It, it was a, a a privilege to see you in action, to see you know the, the kindness that you show people, and um, you know, I, I think what we'll do, you know, we'll make sure I put the links for the charity on and all the links for yourself as well and everyone at Reed. So um, it was a real pleasure. And um, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll, I'll come back and have a cup of tea with you. Yeah. I'm holding your friend to that meal. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. She will. She will. She will. I know that's going to happen. As soon as we're out of lockdown, she'll make sure that happens. Yeah. yeah. No, really nice. <laughs> well, it's been great. That was really good. Thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye. It's just over five years ago, I did something that changed my life. What it did, more than I could have ever realised, it helped me. I have met some absolutely amazing people, some of the people that work in some of these places. Many of them are volunteers, but some of them, it is their job. This is more than a job, this is a calling.